We'll uh, continue with that. Just uh, <coughs> these are the bulkers. We have focused on the container vessels, uh, the wet bulkers, the tankers. They used to range. Uh, there is something called Aframax, US Max, and uh, there are a number of others as well. Um, but the range is here in dead weight tonnage. Go all the way up to <coughs> what is called the ultra large crude carriers, uh, which are bigger than 300,000 tons. Actually, this is the one ship category where the maximum size of vessels has gone down. Because we used to have vessels as big as 550 built in the 70s, but they have now been scrapped. And they were only built because a very special situation in the 70s where the Suez Canal was closed and they had to go around the Cape, around South Africa. Uh, and then there was a market for even bigger tankers. So tankers is the exception to the rule. The maximum size of tankers is not growing anymore. But dry bulkers are growing, so we could add a, a, uh, an extra category here uh, if we wanted to. A few pictures just to uh, give you an idea what things look like. This is a typical Roro vessel, although in this case it's got containers on the deck because you can put containers via the crane here, so it's actually a combination vessel. Uh, these are the ugly ducklings of the sea. Not very pretty, it doesn't look like vessels at all, more like houses. But these are the vehicle carriers, typically used for transporting new cars from uh, Japan to, to the US and the other way around or, or anywhere else. A few big Scandinavian operators here. So this is uh, the Hörgöglen uh, group. These are actually so big and ca catch so much wind, so every now and then you can hear a story that some of them actually blows ashore if you have very strong winds, they have a problem maneuvering. Okay, this I think is the Kiel fer Oslo Kiel ferry. Uh, more like cruise vessels now, but they have a lot of car space and, uh, and truck space uh, under the deck. This then is a pretty old vessel, more like the ones you can see calling in the small port of Molde, used for coastal transport and general cargo, meaning that they can carry almost anything. Uh, inside they will have uh, space which could uh, be filled up with pallets. They could have, I'm not sure about this one, could have some Roro cargo in the end, some of them. And even a small fishing boat, I think it is on the top of the deck, so they can carry almost anything along the coast. But pretty old and not so big. These then are the mega carriers of the world. Uh, here are the dry bulkers, two different variants. Uh, this one could also discharge with its own gear. So it's got a conveyor belt system and, uh, and uh, a system for discharging, for instance, uh, some rock material or iron ore. This is the typical facility where they are loading the dry bulk vessels, uh, typically outside a quarry, uh, iron ore or bauxite quarry or something like that. Then they will have a facility like this with distributors and conveyor belt systems transporting the iron ore and putting it into the different hatches of the vessel. These are pretty special looking vessels transporting liquid natural gas, which is a very growing market, especially in Japan. Japan is a big importer of liquefied natural gas, LNG. Why is that? That's, uh, that's related to a fairly recent incident in Japan. What happened in Japan, if you think about the energy sector, I think it's three or four years ago, maybe more, yeah? Fukushima? Yeah, what happened? Yeah, uh, nuclear power plants melted down and we had problems with r radiation, which meant that they were shutting down quite a lot of their capacity uh, and also in, in some other countries, uh, at least made plans for shutting down their nuclear power. And one of the alternatives is to use liquefied natural gas as an energy source. <coughs> Chemical tankers. If you go to our neighbor community just across the mountain, 
this direction. Um, in Elnesvågen you have a production facility producing chalk slurry, liquefied chalk. Or why it looks almost like milk. And that's for the paper mill industry. Have, has anyone of you tried one of these glossy magazines and used them to fire up uh, a bonfire or in the fireplace? Does it work? It doesn't because it's 80-90% chalk rock material in those glossy magazines. And this is what they're producing out there in uh, our neighborhood community. And they export this liquefied chalk with chemical tankers to the paper mills of Europe. That's one use of chemical tankers. There are hundreds of others. You can identify them by a huge system of pipelines on the deck because they typically can carry different product variants in different compartments and they need separate pipelines for every one of them. And you can also tell that this is a chemical tanker. This is not very visible here, but a big red sign here, no smoking. So this is uh, sometimes pretty explosive stuff. Yeah, okay. I told you about geared and, uh, and gearless container vessels. This is a geared one then with its own cranes that can lift containers onto the decks. This is a bigger container vessel then, intermediate size, almost like the Panamax, which was four and a half thousand. So this is pretty much the size of the container vessels that can pass through the Panama Canal these days. This belongs to the Mediterranean Shipping Company. And these then are not the biggest at the moment, but this used to be the biggest uh, one year ago, 14,000 TEUs. That's an enormous amount of containers. Now you can carry 18,000. Imagine the challenge logistically to handle 18,000 containers in a port. Everything has to be transferred to a train or to trucks. Each truck can take two of those. You need 9,000 trucks onto the system to uh, completely empty the vessel. Um, so there's always been a question, will it continue to grow? Can we still use even bigger vessels? And every time this question has been asked the last 10 years, experts have said that now we reach the maximum. And then next year they build a vessel that is 20% bigger. And this has been happening almost year by year now. So where will it end? Nobody knows really. But there are some limits to the use of these mega carriers. Not all ports have the necessary draft water depth to accommodate them. Uh, and that might be uh, the limit. Super tankers look like this when they're loaded. Could fit several football fields on the decks here, quite big. We used to have, when I was a kid in the 70s, we used to have 15 of those just across the fjord here because there was a huge crisis in the oil sector. So some of them came straight from the shipyards, went into a layup here in the fjord, and laid there for 10 years, and then went to a scrapping yard, and never was in service. That was a pretty special sight uh, back in the 70s. OK, this is an ice class tanker used for the Baltic Sea transport. If you want to have a service, for instance, going to St. Petersburg in Russia via the Baltic Sea, this will have uh, icy conditions in the winter and you need stronger hulls to, to do deal with that. Uh, in many parts of the world you have uh, big inland waterway systems, rivers, canals, and this is one of the typical vessels for that. You can lower the wheelhouse uh, to pass under narrow bridges, for instance. You have those for bulk transport, you have those for container transport, and you have some of them which are barges without their own engines, and then you have sort of a tug unit to propel it. This is sort of a dying class of vessels, the reefer vessels. Used to be the typical way of transporting uh, temperature-controlled cargo, fruit, fish, different uh, uh, commodities in holds that were cool. Uh, now this has been, to a very large extent, replaced by reefer containers. So instead of cooling down the whole vessel, you now cool the container and you can put it on a regular container vessel instead. 
and these are the ones being produced here in this region. Uh, some of the offshore service vessels used for offshore oil and gas explorations and, and production. You all know containers, they come in many variants. Uh, we think about containers as something that's standardized. Uh, these are just a few variants of, of containers. Uh, 40 foot, uh, foldable ones, uh, open top ones, uh, tanker containers, and so on. And then, on the port side, you may have seen these big cranes in some of the major ports. They are very efficient. Uh, taking the containers off the vessel, putting them on trains or trucks, or, or uh, uh, they would be transported by in a smaller port. They don't have, these are very expensive, so it's only the bigger ports that have them. In a smaller port like the Port of Molde, for instance, if you want to handle containers, they would typically use a reach stacker like this, which could stack containers five stories high if, you, if necessary. Straddle carriers are the strange, vehicles like this, which carry the container between the wheels. Some of these are... Anyone here from, from Hamburg? Or the region? Yeah. Yeah. Bre yeah. Bremen. From Bremen, okay. Yeah. In the port of... I, I'm not sure about Bremen or Bremenhaven, but in uh, Hamburg they have yeah. robotized yeah. these. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So some of them are automated and operating on their own, without the driver. Forklifts, you all know, for <coughs> handling pallets. <coughs> and then uh, if um, you have what we call unaccompanied trailers, meaning that uh, you, on a row row vessel, you don't take the truck and the trailer, but only the trailers. On the port side, you will then have some simple uh, trucks for, for uh, moving those trailers. And then you have a special piece of equipment which could actually make a row row vessel a container vessel because these are small trolleys where you can put a container on top of them and make it a row row type of cargo instead of a lift on lift off type of cargo okay this is a bit bleak uh, here but it just shows the maximum sizes of vessels it's actually lying a little bit because as i said the biggest tanker uh, this uh, Nock Nevis, as it was called in the end, was the biggest tanker of the world, but it's now been scrapped. Uh, so now it's actually the biggest container ships, which are the maximum sizes. Uh, you have a bulk carrier maximum here and a passenger vessel. And then compared to one of the aircraft carriers uh, of the United States. Okay. Now. We're talking about the vessels. Now we will focus more on the cargo they are carrying. Um, <coughs> in this chapter from Martin Stopford's book, he uses a term which is uh, a bit strange, called the parcel size. Parcel size, uh, in this sense, means shipment size. The amount of cargo sent in one shipment. So, if we are talking about Parcel sizes, shipment sizes here, they will have different characteristics for different trades. If we first start looking at one of the dry bulk trades, one of the biggest dry bulk trades is coal. Coal as a source of energy, is, is that a thing of the past? Or is it still important? How important is coal, you think? Is it something that we used to rely upon a hundred years ago, or is it still important? Well, if you go to some European cities, uh, British cities, for instance, uh, they would be very dark. The, 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 the tiles and the houses would be dark from using coal as uh, a way of uh, heating their houses. Uh, many years ago. Um, this has mainly stopped as a direct source of heating in these cities in the UK, for instance. But it's still quite important for energy production. The US electricity market, for instance, is 50% coal. Uh, 
And as we shall see on a later figure, it's very much increasing, increasing much faster than the use of oil. And that's a big problem from a CO2 point of view. Coal is transported in, that has two sort of clusters when it comes to shipment sizes. It has one cluster around 50, 60 uh, thousand tons, and then another cluster around 150 thousand tons. And that um, uh, reflects both the, the port characteristics. Some of the ports uh, cannot facilitate the big vessels and then they have to send it in smaller parcels like this. If we look at another trade, grain, food products, it's got a smaller uh, uh, clusters down here, around 25,000 and around 55,000, uh, which means that they will use smaller bulk vessels to transport this. And uh, if we compare these two, we could also explain this not only by the port facilities, but also by a logistical principle, which you may be familiar with. Uh, why, what is the difference between grain and cold, if you're talking about value? Which is the most expensive per ton, you think? Grain or coal? One kilogram of grain versus one kilogram of coal. Which is the expensive one? It is grain, definitely. So one kilogram of grain is a much more high value commodity than coal. And knowing that, how could that affect the parcel size, the shipment size? The shipment size is then bigger for coal than for grain. Yeah, well, that, that might be an element uh, of that. Uh, but generally speaking, if we are talking about, uh, in this case, we are talking about uh, uh, shipment size. We uh, this is then called, in Stoppard's book, it's called parcel size. Um, there is a related thing from the logistics literature called uh, lot size. Lot size, the size of uh, a production batch or batch size. And um <coughs> when we try to optimize logistics costs, Inventory cost is an important element. So if you look at uh, replenishment of an inventory, um, and you have the option of uh, buying things and transporting it by trucks or by a ship, the, the difference would be if you have inventory level here. Um, let's say that you have a sort of a safety stock situation here. If you buy by ships, you will have a big shipment coming here, and then you will use uh, the stuff down to the safety level, and you will have another big shipment coming like this. S let's say every month you get a ship calling with your cargo. The alternative would be to have a more frequent truck operating service, which will give you a lot of smaller shipments every day, maybe. And you get a pattern like this. So this is the ship. This is the truck kind of operation. Now, what happens to the average level of storage in these situations? Well. The average for the ship will be up here. The average with the truck replenishment will be 
down there. And the cost of uh, carrying inventory is related to the value of the cargo that you have uh, in your inventory. And that the level of inventory would be lower from a frequent delivery. This is why we want just-in-time deliveries, right? Uh, so this is also related to the value of the cargo because you typically have a situation where you have what we call economies of scale when it comes to transport costs. Um, so if you have shipment size here and unit transport cost here you will typically have a falling cost function unit transport cost meaning that it's cheaper to have a big shipment um, with a low frequency than uh, smaller and more frequent deliveries. So this means that it will be cheaper to have the shipping option from a transport cost alternative, but then you have the opposite type of function for inventory costs. That's an increasing function of shipment size, which is illustrated by this first figure. So what you need to do to optimize these things is to, to actually minimize the sum of these costs. And that gives you the optimal shipment size. So you actually have two different cost functions here, and you need to balance them. The shipping alternative is very much contributing to the falling unit costs of transport, because it's much cheaper per ton to transport by ship than to transport by trucks. But you need big shipments to fill a ship. And therefore, you need bigger shipment size to utilize the shipping industry. So the trucking industry is somewhere up here on this curve. Shipping industry is somewhere down there. And this is then related to the value of the cargo. So you would expect that a higher value commodity would sh make shipments in smaller batches or smaller um, parcels. And that's reflected by these actual figures. Now, if we look at this graph, it also illustrates the same type of thing. Iron ore, the raw material for steel production, and sugar. Sugar is a much higher value commodity than iron ore when you calculate by the kilo. Again, you will see that sugar is shipped in smaller parcels than iron ore. And here again, one way of presenting it, which now is approaching this, uh, these graphs that I've, I've drawn, you can see different types of cargoes here and the costs of freight, <coughs> the transport costs. And you will see that uh, the the low value commodities are down here, coal, iron ore, crude oil, and then increasing value, grain, sugar, chemicals, containerized cargo, cars, machinery and project cargo. So that's just another way uh, with a falling curve like the one we have illustrated. Okay, the bigger the vessels get, the lower the costs per ton is also getting, and this is part of the discussion of whether the 
the maximum ship size actually will still increase. Is there, you can fairly easily demonstrate that there is falling costs uh, when you're talking about 20, 70, 120, maybe 170,000 tonners. But will it go on? Uh, when you extend the graph, there, there's a discussion around that. Uh, okay, this is the way the shipping market is illustrated by Stopford. Um, you got the cargo types up here, bulk cargoes, specialized cargo, general cargo, and then you have the equivalent ship markets down here. And they are all together forming three different markets here, bulk, liner, specialized cargo. As I said, there is one exemption to the rule, the maximum, no, oh, sorry, now we're talking about the average ship, si ship size and not the maximum one. And you can see for tankers, it's more or less flat. So the average ship, ship size is not growing for tankers. But for the other categories, uh, the gas carriers, the bulkers, the container vessels, it's very much an increasing average size of the ships. Okay, to sum up the bit about these ships, maritime transport is much more diversified than the land-based modes. Uh, if we're talking about a truck and trailer, it's pretty much the same. Uh, could have different engines and things like that, but it's pretty standardized. Ships are not standardized at all. They ca can be produced in a small series of 10 equal ships, but mainly every ship is different. So it makes it a bit harder to analyze in some settings. Uh, we have identified some broad categories of vessels, the dry bulkers, the wet bulkers, container row row, general cargo, specialized vessels. And there are some trends, except for the crude oil vessels, average ship size increases. And except for wet and dry bulk vessels, the maximum ship size also increases. And this is partly driven by the economies of scale and the hub and spoke systems. Have you discussed the hub and spoke systems earlier in this class? What is the hub and spoke system? This is a very prominent uh, structural thing in uh, both passenger and cargo transport. The hubs and the spokes are sort of uh, borrowed from a bicycle wheel type of analogy. This is the hub. These are the spokes. But transport-wise, we could illustrate this by the typical way container transport is organized. If you want to send um, cargo from, um, let's say, an inland city of China, um, one called Wuhan, for instance, uh, and then, then you need to get to the coast via the inland waterway system or railway systems or something like that and you send it to a hub port maybe it's a long way to to the port of shanghai i don't know but that's one of the main that's the biggest chinese container port then shanghai is what we call a hub port collecting cargo from many different parts of china and maybe other parts of asia as well and then, <coughs> let's say they want to send this to the biggest container port of Europe, which is Rotterdam. But let's say that the, f the, the final destination is, is the major city of Molda. <laughs> then, the typical way of organizing this is that you use the big mega carriers to go via the Suez Canal all the way to Rotterdam, which is Europe's biggest hub. And then you have feeder links 
either directly to, to molder, but you could also have a secondary feeder system going via Gothenburg, for instance. And then Gothenburg has feeder links to Rotterdam and different other ports. Rotterdam has feeder links to, uh, has major links to other hubs of the world, uh, for instance, New York uh, or New Jersey. And, uh, and this is the way it's organized, that you collect cargo into these hubs and distribute them through the spoke system. The difference, the alternative to a hub system would be a system of direct links, meaning that you would uh, have a direct link directly from Shanghai to Gothenburg, for instance. That's the alternative. But the reason why this has been a major development over the last decades is that you have these economies of scale. You want to utilize the biggest vessels, and then you need to collect a lot of cargo to fill them. And in order to use those big and very efficient vessels, you need a hub and spoke system to collect enough cargo. If you had a direct link between Shanghai and Gothenburg, there isn't enough cargo for the bigger vessels. You will have to use a smaller vessel, which is more costly. The hub and spoke system is also prominent in the passenger transport. Uh, you will find that most major uh, airline carriers have one hub airport where they try to collect all the passengers into this hub. Uh, SAS, which is flying here, for instance, is trying to collect passengers to Copenhagen, which is their main uh, airport. Uh, then they have all the international flights from Copenhagen rather than from, from Oslo. They do have some from Oslo, but this is uh, the same thing in the passenger business. OK, now trade patterns. Where does this cargo go? So now we are back to a short geography lesson. Well, there are basically some very big connections, uh, which we can see on, the, on this map and a couple of the following ones. Uh, obviously, we've been talking about the emergence of Asia and in particular China over the last years as a major exporter of many commodities. It also means that China needs to be a major importer of quite a lot of raw materials. So a lot of the cargo flows are centered around China, some of them going to Europe through the Suez Canal, some of them uh, crossing the Pacific to North and South America. Um, and then you have quite a major trade across the Atlantic um, between Europe and, and America as well. Uh, this is another way of uh, putting it. Here we have the container uh, uh, major container routes, and you can see that there are uh, some major ones and and uh, some with uh, with smaller volumes here. This is a graphical illustration of the density of the shipping links. So uh, the more red you see, the more uh, frequent the services are, uh, and the blue ones are the weaker ones, and yellow in in the middle. Okay. Um, if we rank them by tons traded, you can see the percentage of uh, the world market indicated here. Um, the Far East Asia trade being uh, a major one. Um, the Middle East to, to Western Europe, also a big one, dominated by oil exports from the Middle East, for instance. And I asked you how many days you would think that it took from China, or many weeks from China to Europe, some five uh, weeks. Here is another way of organizing things. Some operators are operating what we call the round the world service. And this is an example of a round the world service. Going from Rotterdam, across the Atlantic to New York, from New York to Houston in the Mexican Gulf, through the Panama Canal, from Houston to Long Beach, which is outside LA. Uh, Long Beach to Shanghai, crossing the Pacific. And then from Shanghai to Singapore uh, in Asia, then to the Bay of Aden outside the Suez Canal, then to France, Marseille, uh, at, at the Mediterranean coast of France, and 
from Marseille to Rotterdam. Then it's back around the world. And <coughs> here are some sailing times for a bulk ship, which is basically running slower than a container vessels. These are not nautical miles per hour. Why do you think a bulker operates at 13.6 knots and a container vessel at 23? This is a typical pattern, although it's changed a little bit. This figure is a bit old because we've had the development towards slow steaming because the fuel consumption of the vessel is very much dependent on the speed. But still, container vessels are faster than bulkers. Why? It's related to something we talked about 15 minutes ago. Keyword is the cargo they're carrying. Yes? Exactly. The container is usually carrying high value cargoes, electronics, clothes, things like that, which uh, is much, much more valuable per ton than what the bulkers are carrying, uh, iron ore and coal and these things. And that's, that's it. It's about the time costs. It's, uh, because when you transport things, there is an inventory cost on the transport leg as well. So you're losing money from a slow transport, but it doesn't matter that much if it's a cheap cargo. If it's an expensive cargo, speed means more. Okay, so here are the sailing times for the container vessel, a total of 47 days around the world. So uh, the, the bulker would need 80 days. So a typical bulker would be able to do four or five of these round trips a year. Whereas the container vessel could do seven or eight. Okay, here are some costs, but they are a bit old, so you don't need to pay attention to them. <coughs> now, crude oil, <coughs> the origin, we probably know quite a bit about it. Uh, here are the main oil exporters uh, of the world identified with the number of million tons exported. The main exporting region for crude oil is the Middle East. Uh, then you have something in North and, and West uh, Africa. Uh, you have North Sea uh, oil and gas. You have some from Indonesia and some from uh, Latin America. Now, this is also, since Stofford's book now is um, six, seven years old. This has changed a little bit. Do you have any idea which country would be on the map if it was made today, which is not here? Have you heard about a nation that started to export oil and gas to a larger extent than they used to? Have you heard about shale oil or shale gas? It's actually the US, which, which is still a net importer of some stuff, but they have started with a new technology for oil and gas exploration, which has changed their energy supplies in a major way in the last years. Ore exporters, uh, mainly iron ore, but also uh, bauxite and, and some other phosphate rock and so on. Um, major areas, Australia is a big dry bulk exporting region. India, Brazil, uh, Canada, some of the major exporting areas for dry bulk. <coughs> and then coal, uh, you will see that the US and Canada is a big exporter, as is Australia. <coughs> China is both an exporter and importer of coal, it, uh, because there are different qualities of coal. Coal is mainly used for two different purposes. One part is what we call thermal coal, which is used for energy production and heating. 
and the other part is used directly in steel production. Okay. Then we can sum up this before we break again. Um, there are some major trade links in seaborne container transport, mainly the biggest three biggest routes, the Trans-Pacific, China to e US West Coast, for instance, Transatlantic, and the Asia to Europe. You have, of course, other links, but these are the three dominant ones. Then the sourcing areas for bulk transport. Oil, definitely, the Middle East, North and West Africa, North Sea, Venezuela. Um, Russia and Mexico also exporters, but not so much from um, a shipping point of view, using pipelines. Iron ore, Australia, South America and Canada. Coal, Australia, South America, China, Indonesia, South America, Canada and Poland. This is about the level of knowledge that we expect in this course. If you have a question about where are the major shipping links and, uh, and things like that, this is what we expect. Not every detail, but an overview more like this. Time for a break again.